thank you all for coming and thank you for having me. I've never been a part of anything Tic Tech and I'm learning so much about what everyone's doing. And what I'm gonna tell you about today is a project that I've been working on for 15 years um, and everyone can go see it for themselves at dcinbox.com. It's better on a computer than on a phone, but that is the project that I'm gonna talk about today. So who am I? Right now, I'm on sabbatical, and I have been since two Mays ago. So I'm living a very good life where I, um, I live in New York City, and I've been putting up this little sign that says, will you chat with me about politics for three minutes? And I have a timer, and I'm like hearing from people in the strangest of ways. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I've studied American politics from all different levels, but talking to people is one of the like weirdest and neatest ways to understand it. And so that's what I'm doing with a lot of my days right now. I work at Stevens Institute of Technology, which is an engineering school in Hoboken, New Jersey, which has also given me a really neat perspective on what engineers think about themselves and their role in politics. And it's also allowed me to have really good research assistants to do the sorts of technical work that I wanna do. Um, I've also started to do things like more public facing uh, understanding explainers of the work that I do. So this is something that came out in the conversation, which talks about all the research on DC Inbox, which I'll tell you about, I guess I'll tell you right now. DC Inbox is a project where, those are my research assistants, where you have every member of Congress sending official emails to their constituents, and it's the online archive and database of these communications. So I'm gonna do a video demonstration in a little bit about how you can use it, but it's a way to understand what our members of Congress prioritize and what they're willing to say to their constituents. And then finally, this is the other thing that I've done in my sabbatical, is I just finished a book called How to Raise a Citizen and Why It's Up to You to Do It, which essentially says in the United States, we're underserving our young people by not teaching them how to participate in politics. And if we wanna fix it, parents have to do it because schools are a little bit incapable of doing it right now. So that's who I am. And then here's what DC Inbox looks like. Uh, you'll see that there's a search bar where you can put in any sort of term that you wanna go find out about. And then you can also have these limitations. Maybe you wanna understand what Democrats said versus Republicans. Maybe you wanna know what men or women said. Maybe you wanna have a date, it starts and ends. And there's all different ways that you can cut up the data. The reason that I started this project was that I truly thought someone else would have already done it. I was in graduate school at NYU and in 2008 is when I started, and I knew that I wanted something for my dissertation around political communications because that was a background that I came from. And I thought, well, they all get a budget to send these official communi communications. They should all be out there. They should all be archived, but they're not. Uh, I didn't tell my advisors at first that this was a project that I was starting because I didn't know what I would find, and I was afraid of criticism that they did eventually give me, which is, you're making a database of junk mail. Like you're making a, a, a resource that people are looking at that most people delete as soon as it gets into their inbox. But I sort of thought, we have a right to know these things. They are taxpayer funded created communications. And if there wasn't an archive, then historians wouldn't have the ability to piece together how political conversations happen. In the past, U.S. members of Congress used to use franked mail. And all of that franked mail is physical mail that they don't pay postage on, but it goes out to their constituents. And we have good archives of those because they're made of paper. When I went to the Library of Congress to ask about an archive of these, they said, yes, we have them. They're printed. You're welcome to scan them back in if you want to analyze them. The end. And I was like, you're out of your mind. These are digitally created and digitally disseminated. There should be a digital archive of them. But they didn't have funding to do it, and neither did I. But... Uh, I did have a lot of time, and so as a graduate student, I thought I would do that. Something that I like to say when I contextualize people on DC Inbox is that the internet was so much weirder in 2009 than it is now. And I know that there's like plenty of weird stuff on the internet, but when we look at what congressional websites were like in 2009, it was really whoever in the office knew the most about tech kind of clued together an official website. Nowadays, there's about three big vendors in the United States that as soon as you get elected, they come to your office and say, hey, let, let us set up your website. It's a plug and play. Most of them look the same. But back then, it was really, really idiosyncratic. And so when I came at this, I thought, you know what? I'll make a script. It's going to crawl through all the members of Congress, and I'm going to get to sign up to all their e-newsletters, and it's going to be easy peasy. And uh, that's not true, or it certainly wasn't true in 2009. So it ended up being a lot of time and a small amount of money and a bunch of dedicated research assistants that helped me to manually start the database, which was literally going to every member of Congress's official website, putting in a dummy Gmail account, and saying, send your emails here. 
If we have questions on like the technicalities of it, we can do that later. But I do owe thanks to these guys. These were my first set of research assistants when I joined uh, Stevens as an assistant professor. And prior to then, it was like all me, and then it became all me and four people. And I've been able to have four research assistants every year that I'm doing the project. And so it's not just a one woman show, it's me and people who help me. So here's what members of Congress's websites look like. This is one, one model of them. And you'll see that when you first go there, they usually have something that says newsletter sign up. The newsletters that they send out, it's a free incumbent perk. They're all allowed to do it. And essentially they tell you like, here's the votes that I took. Here's the committee hearings that I'm on. I'm having a veterans roundtable, whatever. It's a time for them to tell their constituents what they're doing on their behalf. They can't ask for votes. They can't ask for money. It's not campaign stuff. It's their official .gov capacity in which they send these. Most of the time they look like this, which is kind of boring, but it's essentially like, you know, here's Memorial Day, we should remember these things, their sacrifices, here's the freedoms, and then here's some things that I'm gonna talk about. Um, an act that passed, uh, some committee hearings, a task force, and different sorts of things. They're usually those sorts of like explanatory things, but they're not always like that. Often, you get strange ones that are like this from Paul Gosar. Paul has been in the database since I've started in 2009. So this is after the Donald Trump conviction that happened last week or a week before, where he comes out and says, show trial, new Oxford American Dictionary. And he tells his constituents, you know, this is a sham. It's a miscarriage of justice. This feels political to me. They're not meant to be political. They're meant to be like in my official capacity. However, Paul Gosar has skirted this the whole time. This is um, another image from one of his newsletters where he's explaining to his constituents how he thinks the government works in his view. Something that I've learned in looking at these over time is that Republicans and Democrats use them very, very differently. Democrats tend to be really text heavy that are really just like, here's all the things that are happening. Here's why I took these votes. Republicans tend to be much more image or infographic heavy. Um, there's pros and cons. Theirs are easier to read often, Republican ones, because they're just like quicker, you get it a little bit faster. But in terms of archiving them, they're much harder because as soon as these members leave office, the links to nearly all their images will break. That's not true for text. Text gets retained, these break. Um, and so he's been in the, the data set the whole time, uh, but as soon as he's gone, it'll be interesting to see what happens because they have no responsibility to keep these things live for people. So in this next one, I'm gonna show you a video. Uh, it's about a minute long. And it's how DC Inbox works. And the first search term that I put in is London, which is like, whatever, we're here, I'll see what they're talking about. The second search term that I put in is border, and you're gonna see what it means to have a database that's run by a professor and four research assistants, and why when it's short and fast, it's really easy. But when it's a big topic like border, it takes a while. So that's why it takes a minute and 30 to get through this. Okay, so this should work, yeah. So this is me typing in London in the top. You search and it says, okay, here's all the people who have said London. You can visualize it and it has a histogram from the beginning of the time when they first said it to the end. Democrats are blue, Republicans are red. You can also, when you search, you can click on this HTML and you can see the original for each member of Congress. So here's how it actually looked when it came into an inbox. Um, this one says, uh, the Magna Carta is at the British Museum of London. And I was like, oh, great, I went there yesterday. That's not true, it's at the British Library. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, when I set this up, I was like, ooh, fun, tourism. But she got that wrong. Uh, you can also make a few other types of graphs. This is a map which kind of says, like, which members of Congress are talking about it. My guess is that Connecticut does it a lot because there's, like, colonial stuff and there. There's also New London in Connecticut, so a lot of it's that. Um, so you have to like have the context to kind of figure these things out, but it's all possible because DC Inbox has these things. So this is border. I'm searching for the word border. It's gonna spin for a while um, because it's a database that I have with four other people and not like a really technically powered one. But you can see that border is one where we have people who are in Arizona and Texas talking about it far more than anyone else. And when you look at the histogram of it, you'll notice that there is um, a shape that emerges that kind of speaks to the current American political context. And again, that's gonna take a minute. Okay, so here it is. And it's like, oh God, we have an election coming and we're all gonna talk about this. 
And so the reason that I like DC Inbox is everyone gets to see their own little trees. Like everyone gets their rep and their two senators. And I feel like I get to see a forest. I feel like I get to see how Congress is doing things kind of collectively. And there's so many interesting things that we can learn from this. Uh, and I, I make it open for everyone because I want people to be able to learn whatever it is that they're interested in. So if you do a search here, what you can then do is instead of just visualizing it here or sort of clicking through one by one, is you can generate a CSV, which in talking to my friends who are in the research space, that's one of the easiest manipulable ways to do it. And then it will download for you um, all these columns, which is the subject, the body, the timestamp, bio guide ID, the people, if they're Democrat or Republican in their district. And then you can sort of do the analysis that you wanna do, whether that be text analysis or whether it be simple counts of like who talks about what, um, and you can figure out a lot of things. The way that the back end looks is kind of clunky. It's a dummy Gmail account that just has a bunch of different emails that come in, and then they all get fed through a series of programs to get rendered in DC Inbox. Um, it's, it's nearly in real time. There is like literally a 30 second lag from the time it hits this mailbox until the time it's up online. And then there's a few that get stuck because about 13 members of Congress send e-newsletters from the same email account, and so we have to disambiguate those manually which is annoying, but a lot of this is manual because there's like a lot of small things that happen. On occasion, someone will reach out to me and say like, let me build you a DC Inbox tool. And I'll say, yes, this is the first guy who ever helped me. And he really changed the way that I sort of thought about this because he introduced me to Elasticsearch, which is something I didn't know about. And so DC Inbox runs a lot faster because of volunteer help from people that I don't know who say like, let me show you how to do this. Um, and then I wanna tell you a little bit about why I did this. Why is, I think we deserve to know these things. I actually think every country should have a DC inbox. I think every country that has digital communications happening from a .gov capacity should have the ability to know what their people are saying. Um, and it's something that it's just, it, it feels right to me. It feels like something that we ought to be able to have. Uh, like I said earlier, they're created this way, they're disseminated this way, their archives should be this way. And because things break when members leave office, if not for work like this, or work that does sort of like collecting political tweets or political posts on Facebook, we would not have these things. There is also a ton of things that you can learn from these. And I'm gonna go over a few of the things that I have learned, and then I'll show you a few things that other people have learned. The first things that I have learned is that Republicans send these way more often than Democrats. And you might say, oh, well, there's more Republicans in Congress than there are Democrats. Actually, on average, over the last 15 years, it's about 50-50. It's very, very close. But Republicans send way more messages than Democrats. The only time that they sort of normalize is COVID. So during the COVID-19 crisis, they all got onto constituent e-newsletters to tell people like, here's what we're doing, here's what we know, get masks or don't. Um, and that all sort of happened in a way where Democrats and Republicans both use this with equal likelihood. I've also learned that when members have districts that tend to have more base voters or people who are registered with their party and turn out in the primaries versus what we might call swing voters, they're more likely to look more extreme in their communications. And the way that I did that is, um, I'm not sure if like the term DW nominate scores resonates with people, but it's just a way of saying, based on how legislators vote, who's the most liberal, who's the most conservative, give them a number and figure it out between them. And what I did there was I just said, I'll only scale them on the votes that they reveal in their e-newsletters. Then we can see if they like look more liberal than they are or more conservative. And I found that, yeah, they do, and in ways that are sort of understandable based on their own uh, appreciation of what their district looks like. Women also tend to reveal more votes than men. Uh, and I thought maybe, you know, they're also gonna have to reveal women's issues votes. That's not true. They, they reveal the similar sorts of votes, but they tend to do it more often than men. What you have up here is a graph that came out of co-authored work with a friend of mine that was looking at during the COVID-19 crisis, who was more likely to talk about things like families, children's, schools, and it was women. Uh, within party, women from the Democratic Party talked about it more than men from the Democratic Party, and the same thing within the Republican Party on average. Over here is another piece of COVID work that found that people who come from districts that had higher numbers of COVID deaths were more likely to write about COVID to their constituents, maybe suggesting some sort of responsive representation, which was like, uh, it's kind of serious. I guess we need to tell constituents about it. And then down here um, was co-authored work with someone who was talking about who was willing to come out in favor of um, Black Lives Matter or who wasn't. Um, and you'll see that Democrats did it a lot, sort of spread out through their spectrum from liberal to conservative. 
whereas the Republicans who are willing to talk about Black Lives Matter at all tended to be those who are more conservative in general, is spread more um, in the Democratic Party. There's also silly things you can learn. Like you can learn about who talks about Earth Day. Democrats talk about Earth Day, Republicans don't. That's what those blue spikes are over there. You can say who's talking about rural or any word you want. And Kansas, where I'm from, which is very rural, happens to use the word rural the most. Um, and then you can also look at like lawlessness. Lawlessness is an interesting word, but Republicans used it a bunch for the second half of the Obama term, but they were totally unwilling to talk about it during the Donald Trump term. And then again, as soon as Biden's in office, there's a bunch of lawlessness happening. And so you can kind of see these trends that happen. Five, thank you. There's also stuff that other people have learned. Like this is something where uh, a colleague of mine was like, huh, Republicans are really talking a lot about inflation. And this is about three weeks before it starts to hit the news in a really big way. And this is because Republicans in their e-newsletters were saying inflation, 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 all sorts of things to their constituents. And so sometimes it's a leading indicator of stories that'll come, and then sometimes it's a lagging indicator. It's not really consistent either way, but it's a neat thing to sort of be able to figure out by looking at how they're talking. This is a weird project that I've been doing right now, which is every day uh, I have a bot that crawls through and says, what are the 10 most Republican used words and what are the 10 most Democratic used words? And then I feed it into Midjourney, which is an AI image rendering thing. And then it renders me images and it teaches us a little bit about what politics looks like in pictures and also what AI picture rendering tech looks like. So this is a day where we were talking about aliens and law enforcement and this is what it came up with. And Democrats were talking about like, dental school and funds for things like this. And so it kind of does things that are weird and interesting to look at, and it's been a side project. But something else that's neat to note is Midjourney right now will not draw anything that has Biden in the prompt. So anytime you use president in the prompt, it will give you Donald Trump for the most part, or it'll give you Obama, or it will give you Abraham Lincoln. But it will not draw Biden unless you say vice president under Obama, and then sometimes it'll get you a picture of Biden. And the thing that, that's weird about that is Republicans, they say Biden, it's in the top 10 nearly every day. And by nearly every day, I mean in the last year, there's three days that it's not in the top 10 because they talk about Biden a lot. Democrats don't talk about Biden. Democrats didn't talk about Obama either. Republicans talked about Trump um, a decent amount, uh, as did Democrats, but Republicans tend to do this stuff more. Also, people in the news sometimes use this. So the New York Times two and a half weeks ago decided on their own to use the database to write an article about how members of the Republican Party had been using anti-Semitic tropes at the same time that they were decrying anti-Semitism on US college campuses. And I was really happy about that because, well, not happy about that, but I'm happy that the New York Times was able to do it on their own versus mediating it through me. And that's my goal for this tool is like, let other people use it as they want, figure out the things that they wanna do, and that'll be just great. There's other academics who have used this. Um, I'll go through this a bit fast, but it's just like people who have said, you know what, I wanna see what happened when you talk about healthcare. I wanna see what how people are talking about in terms of polarized communications versus not, using extremist languages versus not. Um, sometimes they talk about how um, the extended party network, like if you're gonna talk about cap and trade, where does that language come from? Um, and then also reactions that people have had to DC or to, to different parts of a presidential policy. The last thing that I'll leave you with is my hopes for DC Inbox. Um, I hope I continue to learn from it. I hope other people continue to learn from it. I hope you use it or try it or figure it out in any way. I would love it if other places replicated it. I'm gonna maybe go to Australia at the end of next year to help them set one up because I think it's something that governments uh, should set up on their own, but on average they don't, so it kind of falls to us to do it. Um, I'd like support to keep it going. And then this is because every time I do anything, my book publisher says I also need to tell people about my book. And so my book in August is How to Raise a Citizen and why it's up to you to do it. But if you ever want to chat with me on Twitter or X, I'm DC Inbox, and it's very easy, and I'm there a lot. Thank you.